Ave Maria Purissima. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On last Sunday of the liturgical year, on the first Sunday of Advent, the Church asked us to consider the end of the world. So we'll do that. As usual, the quotes will be uh, edited and cut and pasted. Before we get into it, let's note that in today's Gospel and elsewhere, our Lord has commanded us to read the signs of the times. Watch ye therefore, because you know not at what hour your Lord will come. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches. Blessed is he that watches. Now, obviously, this is an exciting topic, but we're not supposed to have a chicken little, the sky's flying sort of conniption fit when we, when we think about it. The great Belgian Jesuit, St. John Birchmans, gives us a perfect example of how we ought to act when we think about this very topic. One day during the time assigned for recreation, St. John Birchmans and his fellow Jesuit scholastics were shooting pool. And one of them asked him, hey, John, if you found out the world was going to end right now, what would you do? He kept lining up his shot, and he said, I'd keep right on playing billiards. Now, what's the point? St. John Birchmans was supposed to be taking recreation, and he was, and he's supposed to be in the state of grace, and he was. In other words, he was doing just what he was supposed to be doing at that moment, and our Lord expects us to be doing our duty when he comes again. So if we're in a state of grace and we're doing our duty, we're all right. The most important thing is not when in history we live, but how we die. The most important thing is to die in the state of grace. If we die in the state of grace, we're going to be all right, okay? Then we're saved. That's the most important thing, the one thing that matters. All right, so much for an introduction. Let's turn to the topic at hand. Today we're going to consider what we've been told about the state of the world, about the moral climate of the world before the second coming. There's a fascinating passage in the Catechism of the Catholic Church which speaks of that moral climate, the moral climate of the end times. Quote, before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Close quote, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. So the Catechism is speaking explicitly of an apostasy from the truth. So prior to penetrating into the particular pronouncements we find in sacred scripture, let's pause for a moment and consider exactly what it is when we refer to the word truth. It seems like a funny thing to have to talk about, but those are the days we live in. Truth. There are two common usages for the word truth. Truth commonly refers either to truth and understanding, that is to say, truth in our judgment, which is also known as logical truth, or truth in speech, which is also known as moral truth. So logical truth is truth in judgment, and moral truth is truth in speech. Logical truth means an agreement of mind with a thing. This is my hand. That's an altar rail. That's a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So truth, when we're talking about logical truth, we're talking about a judgment which agrees with reality, a correspondence between my mind and the thing. Error is a judgment that doesn't agree with reality. For example, I think that St. Anne. My mind does not correspond to the thing. So much for logical truth. What about moral truth? Moral truth means the agreement of my speech with my mind. In other words, when we say what we think, that's true. When we, say what, what we, when what we say is not what we think, that's false, and everybody knows that's a lie. So logical truth means the agreement of the mind with the thing. Moral truth means the agreement of the speech with the mind. All right. So we're considering what we've been told about the state of the world, about the moral climate of the world before the second coming, and we've seen that the, 
the catechism says the church must pass through the final trial that will shake the faith of many believers in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at a price of apostasy from the truth. Let's turn to the scriptures. As we tackle this question today, we're going to see that we've been given a fairly detailed description about the general moral state of the individuals living in the end times, and that scripture is very clear, very specific, as regarding truth and the reaction of men who live in the last days to truth. We'll start by focusing on the state of individuals in the last days, and then we'll pull back to get a more panoramic view of the state of society itself at that terrible time. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and following, quote, But know this, that in the last days dangerous times will come. Men will be lovers of self, covetous, haughty, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, criminal, heartless, faithless, slanders, incontinent, merciless, unkind, treacherous, stubborn, puffed up with pride, loving pleasure more than God, having an appearance indeed of piety, but disowning its power. These men also resist the truth, for they are corrupt in mind, reprobate as regards the faith. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. That's quite a list. If we had the time, we could easily spend an hour just unpa unpacking the implications in, that, in this one scripture. But we'll just touch on a few of the points very quickly. In the last days, men will be puffed up with pride and lovers of self. They'll be faithless to the point of being reprobate, meaning they have so abused grace that as a just punishment, they'll no longer seriously or intelligently care about their eternal salvation. They'll be incontinent, meaning they'll be gluttons and burn with lust, and so not surprisingly, they'll love pleasure more than God. They will have an appearance of piety without the virtue. Cornelius Elapide explains this means they will profess to be Christians, although they will be both very wicked in their works and perverse in their ideas. And because mental integrity is clouded by various lusts and vices, their minds will be corrupted and they'll be resistant to truth. Resistance to truth. In the first chapter of his letter to the Romans, St. Paul discusses his sin and its consequences in some detail. Resisting the truth, excerpts from Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Okay, so that's plain enough. Wickedness, uh, in their wickedness, they've rejected the known truth. By sinning against the known truth, their minds have become darkened. Whenever we sin, our minds are darkened and our wills are weakened. That's scary enough. Now listen to this. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonor of their bodies among themselves. Okay, so they've sinned uh, it, by darkening their minds against the light of reason, and as a consequence, God gives them up to impurity. Now that raises a question. What does the scripture mean when it states that God gives them up to impurity? St. John Chrysostom says that in punishment of their will for blindness, their willful rejection of the known truth, God permitted them to fall into the foulest, most shameful and unnatural sins of uncleanness. In other words, as a just punishment for their pride, as a just punishment for their willful blindness and error, God withdraws his grace, and this permits them to fall into those shameful sins. We'll hear about those right now. Back to the scripture. It's edited. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. <clears throat> Their woman exchanged natural relations for unnatural, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion, committing shameless acts and receiving their own persons the due penalty for their error. Now, we've talked about this before. A people who reject the known truth are doomed to blindness and the worst kinds of perversity. 
And as we turn back to the scriptures, we'll see that an outbreak of San Francisco behavior isn't the only result of denying the known truth. Listen carefully to this list of sinful, vicious behaviors that sprout up in the wake of denying the known truth. St. Paul. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and improper conduct. They were filled with all manner of wickedness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but approve those who practice them. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. So there's a terrifying list of the rotten fruits of resisting the known truth. We'll continue by turning to 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the last times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to spirits of error and doctrines of devils, speaking lies hypocritically and having their conscience seared. Close quote, the inspired inner word of God. Now that's really interesting. Every day in the last gospel, which is of course the beginning of the Gospel of St. John. Every day in the last Gospel, we hear our Lord called the Word. In fact, we all genuflect at that phrase, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Okay, now St. John wrote his Gospel in Greek. The Greek word that St. John used here is logos. Logos is Greek for word. In other words, we could say the logos was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. So our Lord is the Word, our Lord is the logos. Logos is the Greek word for word. Okay, so what, Padre? Why would we care that logos is the Greek word for word and we could call our Lord the logos? Let's go back through the scripture real quickly and we'll see why. In the last time, some will depart from the faith, word for that, apostasy, giving heeds to spirit of error and doctrines of devils. That's pretty self-explanatory. In the last time, some will depart from the faith, giving heeds to spirit of error and doctrines of devil, speaking lies hypocritically. Speaking lies hypocritically. The Greek word here used for lies is pseudologos. Pseudo logos. Pseudo means false. Men who apostatize and follow demons, following, speaking false words hypocritically. Under, in other words, under the pretense they're true. And then, if we look at today's gospel in the Greek, we read at the end of the world there will be pseudo Christs. I'm not going to read the, the Greek part of it. And there's pseudo uh, prof- prophets. And the commentary refers you to uh, St. Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, where it talks about the pseudo-teachers, the false Christ, false prophets, false teachers, false words, false Christ, false prophets, false teachers. Okay, so scripture makes this absolutely remarkable contrast. On the one hand, we have the true teacher, the true prophet, the true word, the true Christ, the true logos who has made flesh and dwelt amongst us, who speaks only true words, and has commissioned men and sent them out, guided by the Holy Spirit to teach only the true gospel. So that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have the warning from Scripture in the last days that with false Christ and false prophets and false teachers performing false signs and false wonders and preaching a false faith with false words, hypocritical false words, doctrines of devils spoken by men that have apostatized who are guided by evil spirits. It's an amazing contrast between truth and falsity. Speaking of the great signs and wonders performed by the false Christ and false prophets, which will seduce many, Cornelius the Lapide explains that the people will not be seduced, quote, by the strength of the seducers, but by the negligence of those being seduced. Close quote. In other words, in those days, if someone is seduced by a false prophet or false teacher, it'll be due to his own negligence. It'll be his own fault. Those who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. Okay, so we've been considering the meaning of this scripture. The Spirit expressly says that in the last time some will depart from the faith, giving heeds to spirit of error and doctrines of devil, speaking lies hypocritically, and having their conscience seared. Let's quickly consider that last clause, having their conscience seared. Cornelius Lapide explains that this phrase, having a seared conscience, should be understood 
understood as meaning having a moral corruption that is so complete that the person is hardened in its evil ways. And so he has a complete loss of the sense of sin. In other words, he's become a reprobate. That's the worst possible state in this life. We'll continue by turning to 2 Timothy 4, 3 and following. For there will come a time when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heap up to themselves teachers according to their own lusts, and they will turn away from hearing the truth and turn aside, rather, to fables. The commentary points out that the hearers will run after novelties and teaching, which favors their passions. Cornelius Elapide comments, Many men devoted to sensual pleasures will seek teachers similar to themselves, who will lead them away from a sound faith and the discipline of a Christian life, to heretical errors and a licentious life and corrupt morals. These men, full of vain and carnal desires, have itching ears. In other words, they love to hear novel things, curious things, soft and effeminate things, sensual things. These men shall seek for themselves teachers who will not sting them with words or scrape away their vices, but rather teachers who will deceive them into believing what they wish regarding their sins by preaching pleasantries worthy of applause. In other words, they, don't, they won't want to hear the truth because it'll hurt. They don't want to hear the truth because it means they'd have to change their sinful and disordered ways of life and their sinful and disordered ways of thinking. They would rather have teachers affirm them in their sins. They would have, rather have preachers lie to them. They'd rather have preachers tell them myths and pleasantries. They'd rather have teachers tell them what they want to hear than correct their false beliefs and vices and perhaps hurt their feelings. They want teachers that'll tell them things like, how do you know it's wrong unless you've tried it? Your body, your choice. Don't worry. God made you that way. You can follow your appetites as long as no one gets hurt. The sin of Sodom was just a lack of hospitality. Well, yes, there is a hell, but no one goes there. You don't really think a loving God would actually send anyone there, do you? Don't be so dogmatic. There are many paths to heaven. It's not a sin. No one takes humana vitae seriously. You're just being responsible. It's sinful to be in union with the conciliar church. Okay, we've taken a quick look at a few scriptures which speak of the moral state of men in the last days. What have we seen? We've seen that in those days the men will be puffed up with pride and self-love. They'll love pleasure more than God. They'll profess to be Christian, but they'll be both very wicked in their works and perverse in their ideas. They'll be resistant to the truth. We've seen that this rejection of the known truth dooms a people to blindness and the worst kind of sins and perversity. We've considered detailed lists of those sins, and we've seen that Scripture explicitly teaches that although such people know that those who do these kind of wicked things deserve to die, nonetheless they not only do them, but approve others who are practicing them. We've seen in the last times there will be false Christs and false prophets and false teachers performing false signs and false wonders and preaching a false faith with false words, hypocritical false words, Doctrines of devils spoken by men who have apostatized and are guided by evil spirits. And that those who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. We've seen that men won't want to hurt the, hear the truth because it'll hurt. It means they'll have to change their sinful and disordered ways of life and their ways of thinking. We've seen they'd rather have teachers affirm them in their sins and lie to them than correct their false beliefs and their vices and hurt their feelings. And we've seen that resistance to the truth results in a moral corruption so complete that a man becomes hardened in his evil ways and suffers the complete loss of a sense of sin, which is commonly known as being a reprobate. So if we're going to summarize what we've seen thus far, the last times we characterized by a social atmosphere that's absolutely basted in lies and deception, filled with people that are deliberately and obstinately resistant to the truth, and therefore live with darkened minds and depraved morals. We're getting a clear picture of what the catechism means when it states the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers in the form of a religious deception 
offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from truth. Now we're going to take a more panoramic view of the moral atmosphere. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, we read, quote, Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day of the Lord will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Here we see that Scripture explicitly teaches the day of the Lord, judgment day, the end of the world, can't come unless there first be an apostasy, a great falling away from the true faith, a great revolt against the true faith. And then in the wake of that apostasy, in the midst of it, the great apostasy, the man of son, sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, will be revealed. Blessed John Henry Newman, summarizing the teaching of the fathers on this point, states the fierce in lawless principle, which historically is repressed by the governing powers, will finally break completely loose in those terrible times, spawning heresy, schism, sedition, revolution, and war. And he states that, quote, the coming of Christ will be immediately preceded by a very awful and unparalleled outbreak of evil, called by St. Paul an apostasy, a falling away, in the midst of which a certain terrible man of sin and child of perdition, the special and singular enemy of Christ, Antichrist, will appear. That this will be when revolutions prevail and the present framework of society breaks to pieces. Close quote. So there'll be an absolutely terrible, unprecedented outbreak of evil during which society will be torn into pieces by apostasy, heresy, schism, sedition, revolutions, and war. Now, before we go any farther, we'll pause briefly to make sure we all understand which e what each of those terms mean. Apostasy. Apostasy means a baptized person completely rejects Christianity whole and entire, chucks it overboard, and either embraces a non-Christian religion, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Satanism, or has no religion whatsoever. That's a mortal sin against the faith. An apostate loses the faith, and God is under absolutely no obligation to give it back to him. Cornelius Elapidi, there's no surer sign of reprobation than anyone should apostatize from the faith. Heresy. Heresy means a baptized person pertinaciously denies or doubts any revealed truth of the Catholic faith. In other words, he stubbornly de denies the revealed truth even when he has been shown to be wrong. Nowadays, heretics are often called dissenters. Cornelius Elapide. Heresy is Greek for choosing. A heretic, therefore, is one who chooses what he will believe, and therefore does not believe those things which must be believed according to the teachings of the doctors in the church. So this is also mortal sin against the faith. A heretic loses the faith. And again, God is under absolutely no obligation to give it back to him. Schism. Schism occurs when either a group or even an individual, while preserving the true faith, nevertheless voluntarily, knowingly, and deliberately separates himself from the unity of the church, either by refusing to submit to the authority of the Pope and or to remain in communion with those who are subject to him. Schism has been called the crystallization of orthodox dissent. Cornelius Lapide. Schism is a grave and savage sin because of the wrong done to Christ. St. Cyprian and St. Jerome teach that schismatics are worse than the men who crucified Christ because his seamless garment, namely the church, is torn and separated, which not even the Jews and Gentiles who crucified Christ dared to do. Unlike apostasy and heresy, pure schism is not a sin against the faith because a schismatic individual group has maintained the faith. What they've done is cut themselves off from the vine. Over time, schism typically creeps into this heresy because it becomes necessary to deny the primacy of the Pope. But as such, schism is a mortal sin against charity. Sedition. Sedition is the crime of stirring up a revolt, disturbance, or violence against lawful civil authority with the intent to cause its overthrow or destruction. Sedition has to do with organizing and encouraging opposition to government rather than directly participating in its overthrow. It's a mortal sin against peace. Revolution, 
Revolution is the usually violent attempt by many people to end the rule of one government and start a new one. So that's the big picture. And it terms the moral climate of society in the end times. At the time of the great apostasy, this great rebellion, there will be a terrible, unprecedented outbreak of evil. Society will be racked by apostasy, heresy, schism, sedition, revolutions, war, and societal breakdown. We'll turn back to scripture. Second Thessalonians 2, 9 and following. And his coming, we're speaking of the coming of the Antichrist, and his coming is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all wicked deception to those who are perishing. For they have not received the love of truth that they might be saved. Therefore God shall send them the operation of error, that they might believe falsehood, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have preferred wickedness. But we, brethren, beloved of God, are bound to give thanks to God always for you, because God has chosen you as first fruits unto salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Close quote, the inspired, inerrant word of God. Now this is very, very interesting. In the midst of this chaos, in the midst of the societal breakdown and great apostasy, the Antichrist will appear with satanic power and satanic signs and lying wonders, the Greek here has pseudo-miracles, and with all wicked deception. We've already seen that with the other false prophets and other false Christs. But what's really important is notice who is going to be deceived. The scriptures are absolutely clear. As I read this passage again, pay close attention to exactly who is going to be deceived by the Antichrist. Quote, those who are perishing have received not the love of truth that they might be saved. Therefore God shall send them the operation of error that they might believe falsehood, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have preferred wickedness. Close quote. So who exactly is going to be deceived? Men that don't want to hear the truth because it will hurt, because it means they're going to have to swallow their pride and change their sinful and disordered ways of life and their sinful and disordered ways of thinking. Men who would rather have their leaders affirm them in their sins and lie to them than correct their false beliefs and vices and perhaps have their feelings hurt. Men who would not love the truth and refuse to receive it. Men who would rather believe false words from false teachers than believe the true words from the true word of God. And the men who are seduced by these lies are seduced because they want to be seduced. Since they don't love the truth, God will permit them to have what they do want and what they do love which is the lie. What does it mean to say that God will send them the operation of error that they may believe falsehood, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth but have preferred wickedness? The Haydock commentary explains that this means that God shall allow them to be deceived by lying wonders and false miracles as a punishment of their not loving the truth. In other words, when it says that God will send them the operation of error, it doesn't mean he will cause them to believe the lies. After all, God desires the salvation of all men, and it would be heretical to deny that. God does, it doesn't mean, in other words, that God will cause them to believe the lies, but rather that it's a just punishment for the rejection of the known truth, as a just punishment for their willful and stubborn blindness and error, he's going to withdraw his grace. And the result of him withdrawing this grace will permit them to be deceived by the Antichrist. It's very sobering. When it says that the reason this will happen is, quote, that all may be judged who have not believed the truth, but have preferred wickedness, close quote, the Greek here, word used here for judge means to be judged, condemned, and punished. And why? For refusing to believe the truth. Those who don't want to follow Christ, those who don't want to believe the, believing his, the teaching of his church, those who want to live the way they want to live, will believe the lie, and they'll follow the Antichrist. It's that simple. We're also told who's not going to be deceived. Verse 12, But we, brethren, beloved of God, are bound to give thanks to God always for you, because God has chosen you as firstfruits unto salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief for the truth. The operation of error and the marvels and seduction of the Antichrist will not deceive those who love and believe in the truth. In May of 1897, Pope Leo XIII stated in his encyclical on the Holy Spirit, quote, Whosoever faileth by weakness or ignorance 
may perhaps have some excuse before Almighty God. But he who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. Close quote. He who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. We're all familiar with that terrifying statement of our Lord. We can find it in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verse 29. He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, he shall never have forgiveness, but shall be guilty of an everlasting sin. Those are the words of truth himself. Resisting the truth is one of the sins against the Holy Ghost. And I quote from a standard Catholic reference work. In particular, deliberate resistance to the known truth may be regarded as specially directed against the work of the Holy Ghost in the soul. Generally, this so hardens the soul to the inspirations of grace that repentance is unlikely. Close quote. Back to Leo XIII. Whosoever faileth by weakness or ignorance may perhaps have some excuse before Almighty God, but he who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. In our days, this sin has become so frequent. He's writing in 1897. In our days, this sin has become so frequent that those dark times seem to have come, which were foretold by St. Paul, in which men, blinded by the just judgment of God, should take falsehood for truth and should believe in the prince of this world, who is a liar and the father thereof, as a teacher of truth. As it says in 2 Thessalonians 2.10 and 1 Timothy 4.1, God shall send them the operation of error to believe lying. In the last time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to spirits of error and the doctrines of devils. Close quote, the vicar of Christ. Well, you're in very good company if you've been thinking that we may very well be living in these terrible times. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. I don't want to hear it. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. My mind is made up. I'm not going to change my ways. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. I'd rather keep my options open. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. Don't want to be extreme. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. It's not that black and white. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. People might think I'm some kind of fundamentalist. Our Lord said the truth will set you free. Can't be that bad. Everybody's doing it. Today, today, and don't put this off, before you leave, and throughout the day, take the time to seriously search your mind and your heart. Ask yourself, am I open to the truth? Am I a truth seeker? Or am I resistant? To the truth. It's one of the most important questions you can ever ask yourself. Ask yourself if the Antichrist appeared this week, whose camp would I be in? If the Antichrist appears during my lifetime, whose camp will I be in? He who resists the truth through malice and turns away from it sins most grievously against the Holy Ghost. The church must pass through a final trial in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth.